live a life of significance. The choice is yours. Hi, this is uh, the Duke University Life of Significance series where we're exploring how we matter, what matters, and having a more inclusive view of who matters. And we hope through the series to share stories that will inspire and tickle your imagination and give you ideas for creating a life that matters. And I'm Sun Yin Shang. I'm the executive director of Duke University's Fuqua Coach K Center on Leadership and Ethics. And I have as my co-host today, Greg Jones. Greg is the president of Belmont University. And prior to that, he was a dean of Duke University. And if I were going to, if you're going to ask me who are some of the heroes in my life, Greg would be high up on the list because one of the things that Greg, one of Greg's superpowers is he doesn't stop believing in you even when you may not always believe in yourself. And so Greg is joining us as a co-host and we have here with him, his dear friend, Kim. And uh, Kim is an impact investor, entrepreneur, who helps generate imaginative solutions to many of the social issues and, and challenges that we face today, uh, including poverty. And he helps uh, us create individuals, also create a life of abundance. And he is infectious as you will uh, soon discover. He's also a brilliant scientist and also one of the most humble people uh, I have uh, ever, ever encountered. And so without further ado, Greg, why do you kick us off with the first question? Thank you, Sanyin. It's a great joy to be with you. And uh, Kim, thanks for making the time. It's great to see you even- It's great uh, to be here. <laughs> um, I wanna ask you, you know, you've, uh, as, as Sinyan noted, you, you've been a scientist, a chemist who uh, got a PhD in chemistry, started a company, and then uh, over the last two decades, you've, uh, you decided that writing checks uh, as a philanthropist wasn't going to address the big issues of the day in terms of poverty, and you've got projects all around the world and uh, such extraordinary uh, creativity that you've been, uh, you've been doing, and I'm just curious how you, what led you to those sorts of uh, activities and what does a life of significance mean to you? Well, it's great to be with you. And uh, I, I, I guess I realized at, at one stage about 20 years ago that generosity um, is insufficient and that the real goal of giving should be justice. Uh, and the difference between generosity and justice. I think generosity as donors just kind of makes the donor feel good usually. Whereas justice, we look at justice it actually implicates the, the donor. Um, and justice means that we have to make larger changes and they have to be more sacrificial. I think in, in terms of how we uh, generally want to, to address the inequality uh, and, and the social uh, injustices that's out there. So I became disillusioned really with my own philanthropy, with my own generosity uh, and, and realized that when you have money, the easiest thing to do is just to write a check to charity and think that you've done your bit. When actually um, what people really need uh, in the developing world uh, is, is people who can come alongside them and help them to build and scale businesses that can address uh, several issues. One is job creation. Uh, two, uh, provides independence for, for people to sort of look after their own families. Um, and three, that can also address social, social needs. So um, we began really um, looking at some of these big social challenges and, and asking ourselves as business people who are supposed to be creative, um, instead of doing the easy thing, which is to write a check for charity, can we design businesses, uh, sustainable businesses that are scalable, that can, are going to be profitable, but that can also address these social needs and social challenges. So in a sense, it doesn't really matter what that social challenge is. You know, that's, that's how, we, um, how we look now at, at all the investments we, we make. So it could be um, employing people, in prisoners in, in a telephone call center, 
uh, to create a, a telephone call center, paying them, upskilling them, and then re-employing them when they are released from prison. It could be rescuing survivors of the sex industry and uh, help, help to upskill them with different jobs and then creating uh, job opportunities for them. And we have uh, several hundred uh, employed in the Philippines uh, who, are, who are survivors and then several hundred also in Vietnam and, and, and Cambodia. Or it could be looking just at the poverty in, in the rural parts of the world uh, where um, you know, it, it's just so difficult to, to create real sustainable jobs uh, for people who are, you know, who've for generations been doing um, subsistence farming. How, how, do you, how do you help these people out of, out of poverty? And, and there it, it, it's about um, some new models in, in terms of creating um, organic type farming, uh, permaculture type farming, um, uh, but where you, you, you gather people together uh, and, and do it at scale. Or we could be looking at um, the challenge of low cost education. How do you provide low cost education in the slums uh, in, in Asia and in, in Africa? Well, the answer is technology. It's, it's, it's by uh, using tablets, uh, getting all your lesson plans on the tablets, uh, where parents then pay $5 per child per month uh, and you pay teachers and you pay your suppliers using mobile money and you, you, you cut down on your back office and therefore you reduce the cost and, and therefore you're then able uh, to create a business at scale um, you know, for $5 per child per month. And uh, we, we now have five and a half thousand schools with that model with a million kids, primary school kids in our schools. And, and post COVID when the school shut down, you know, was a challenging time, had a pivot over to an online for these primary school kids. But as soon as, as, as the schools reopened, thankfully 700,000 kids turned up. Um, so so it's, it's looking at different kinds of challenges that we have in our society and saying, can we design uh, enterprise-based solutions um, that, that are gonna be sustainable and scalable and commercially viable, but they can also address uh, these kinds of social, uh, social needs and challenges. Um, so it's, it's looking a whole variety of things. And, and my, uh, to, to sort of answer your question of where I got started was, you know, I got, just got disillusioned uh, when I was on holiday in South Africa and, and went into the slums uh, and decided that um, I needed to sort of pivot out of um, uh, biotech venture capital fund management and, and use the experience uh, to now run what we now call social impact funds. But 20 years ago, we called it social venture capital. Uh, and my first investment was uh, to uh, buy 40,000 acres of badly degraded farmland uh, and um, reverse the, the degradation there and, and, and build a reserve um, fencing about 75 kilometers of elephant proof fencing and then returning big game animals to, to that reserve uh, after 150 years. There have been no animals there for 150 years. Then build a five-star hotel there, or a lodge, uh, and then using an ecotourism model uh, to you know, bring restoration to, to the land, to, to, to get the, the, the conservation projects going, and then to employ um, AIDS orphans. Can we, can we take these AIDS orphans and train them and upskill them and give them, create an environment for flourishing that they will grow and develop their full potential so that they can serve five-star guests and, and, and develop uh, and be the largest contributor to the local economy uh, as, the, as the largest employers uh, there. Um, so using an enterprise model, an investment model to, to, to uh, address the whole big question issue that we have about loss of habitat, loss of biodiversity, uh, you know, 
and and the whole thing of climate change and uh, and so on. So so it's, it's looking at a whole range of different kinds of, of challenges and say, hmm. as business people, we are always about problem solving. So can we design business models that can address these kinds of challenges on a sustainable basis? Tim, your, your passion is inspiring. And I think if I were redoing the intro, I would actually add two more, uh, two more uh, monikers. Is one is your futurist, um, <laughs> mind thinking, and it's a co-creation element in so much of the solutions that you are uh, you and your team are bringing about. And then two, I would say you're a societal steward, right? Even with the, with the farmland, it's a stewarding of the earth, but it's also a stewarding of people. And an underlying set of beliefs are one, that we're also interdependent, that the challenges we're facing today are interdependent, they're complex, and therefore we have an ecosystem mindset. Absolutely. Heard. And then to bring it down to the very human level, what I also heard is like whether it's um, is uh, sex worker survivors or prisoners, you know, or or AIDS orphans. It's this belief in the inherent value and worth of every individual, and being able to bring that to light. And that can we dive into that a little bit more? I mean, like. We're sure, sure. I mean, as, as, as a Christian, I became a, a, a Christian, um, you know, just prior to coming to university. You know, fundamentally, I believe that man's been created in the image of God and therefore have intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the, the young kids that we are schooling, they have the same potential that we have. They just don't have the same opportunities. You know, and, and part of, of what we are wanting to do is to give them the opportunities. Um, they have the same ability, same talent. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I grew up poor. Uh, and, you know, my parents were immigrants from China. Dad came to Malaysia at the age of 18 with nothing and built a small business. Um, we, we grew up in a tin shed. And you know we, we have a well in, in our backyard uh, for water, um, and you know and and I I know um, many many who have that kind of background have the same potential same ability uh, that I have, but unlike me, they haven't been given the opportunities. I've just been blessed by by being given the opportunities. So that origin story, thank you for sharing that with us. So, because it also underscores this idea where we live in sometimes a very individualistic society where we are, um, we, we sometimes take on this myth that we are self-made, right? And forget about all the investments others have made in us. So tell us about some of the heroes in your life who has seen the possibilities in you and- Oh, teachers at school, I mean, they're so important. So, you know, I think if we all look back, you know, we were all inspired at some stage by a teacher in our, in our career, you know, who inspired us either to do philosophy, to do, you know, in my case, to do science. Just had a wonderful, I had a wonderful history teacher. And so initially I wanted to be a historian, go do history and, you know, be a lawyer and then I'm in politics. But then I had, you know, the following year I had a wonderful science teacher and showed me the world of science and suddenly, you know, I was hooked. So, so I think, you know, our teachers are so important. This is why I think, you know, um, the, the schooling, the education piece is so important. Um, and then outside, outside of, 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 of teachers, the people that have inspired me, Nelson Mandela, you know, I mean, the, the ability of this man to forgive, you know, all the people that have hurt him and his country and his people, incarcerated him for, what, 20 something years. Um, I mean, you know, without him, South Africa would have blown up. I mean, there would have been a civil war. I mean, what, what, what incredible, you know, um, 
responsibility he had to, to lead that, that, that nation. Um, in the area of science, you know, my, my hero is, is, is uh, Sir Fred Sanger, double Nobel Prize laureate, who basically gave us the foundations for the bio, whole biotech industry. But the most humble, gracious man you'll ever meet. Um, and, and I remember as a young PhD student uh, presenting a, 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 a sort of minor uh, paper at, at a forum uh, at Cambridge. And I was told that Sir Fred was, was in the audience. I mean, it absolutely terrified me, but you know, he was just so gracious. So, you know, and, and, and some of the, the, the smartest, night, you know, uh, people are also the most humble. Sir John Templeton, um, Sir John, you know, for all his ability as an investor was, you know, a truly, truly humble, modest man. And that humility piece is just so important. Uh, so the people I, I love and respect the most are, are those who have shown that humility uh, about them. Mm, thanks for that. And, and I want to come back to that humility dimension. But I want to ask you a question that actually reflects some of your own humility. Um, I love the stories you tell and your projects that you talked about earlier are so inspiring. Um, whether it's the call center in Singapore or the, the project with uh, getting sex workers uh, out of the trade in the Philippines and training them in digital photo editing or the education programs in Africa. Uh, you didn't talk a lot about the, uh, the outcomes that those projects have had, and they're even more inspiring. The recidivism rate at the, in the call center compared to Singapore's national recidivism rate or the opportunities that are now being provided to the, to the former sex workers and their new life, or the outcomes of your education program, which, uh, you know, I, if I recall correctly, in Uganda was about 30% above the national average. Um, could you talk some about those outcomes? Because part of what I see is so inspiring is that you're really focused on outcomes and not just on intentions. Uh, that you really use metrics to assess, are we accomplishing what we're hoping to accomplish? Yeah, we, we, we love measuring these kinds of things wherever we can. Uh, obviously, uh, outputs are important, but outcomes are, are really, you know, really what we're after. And in terms of education, the outcome is, 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 is that they sit a national exam in each of these countries. And we, we then know uh, and you, in Uganda, three years running, it's been a hundred percent pass rate from our slum schools, compared with the government's forty-five percent uh, national average. Um, so we're certainly outperforming, um, and uh, with uh, recid recidivism, um, you know, we're down at about two, three percent, Greg. But that's only just four years. So give us a bit more time. Um, that compares with about 60% in the UK and, and the US. You know, within two years, about 60% of our ex-offenders will reoffend. Um, and, you know, and it's not surprising, you know, if we, if, we, if we understand that these people are broken and part of what you know, the creative genius of business can do is actually to help these broken lives, to, to rebuild brokenness, to rebuild broken relationships with their families. So, so you, you, we pay them a minimum wage in prison. Uh, they come up with money in their pockets. They, they are able to send money home to their families who kind of disown them and, and are ashamed of them. But once they start sending money home, you know, family starts to, to, to revisit and, and there's restoration of the family. Then when they are released, they come out and, and we rehire them. Uh, and and in, it's an environment where they then don't have to go back to their old friends, right? Their family relationship restored. They are now working in an environment where they know they are being loved and accepted. Why? Because the CEO is an ex-con the CFO is an ex-con, the head of training is an ex-con, and nobody needs to hide their, their backgrounds. They're accepted, right? Mm. And they belong. And, 
And, and, and we all need a sense of belonging, you know? And, and, and it's creating these kinds of environments of belonging that we will see people flourish. Mm. Um, and, and that's what we seek to try and do all the time. And therefore, leadership becomes really, really important, right? We need leaders who can create these kinds of environments uh, for human flourishing where there's a sense of family, where there's a sense of belonging. Mm. Uh, so, so yeah, you know, these, these outcomes are, are, are really, really important. That's, that's wonderful. And, and your invocation of leadership, I think, is really crucial. Uh, you couldn't do all these projects around the world without training leaders and developing them. And you've talked uh, eloquently about the importance of humility in terms of the people uh, that uh, you admired and who have meant a lot to you. And I think you also look for humility in the leaders of uh, your projects. Why is humility important uh, when you're developing entrepreneurial projects and trying to find these solutions? <laughs> What matters about humility? We look for four qualities um, when we're making these investments. One is obviously competence, competence rather than intelligence. So I rather invest in somebody who's built a small business in the slum than an MBA kid, you know, out of uh, uh, Ivy League University, because I know how hard it is to build these kinds of businesses amongst the poor. So obviously competence, they need be hardworking is extremely tough. Uh, integrity, and sometimes we spend a lot of time, you know, just drinking tea and getting to know them on the integrity issue. And then finally, the fourth quality we look for is humility or, or modesty, hmm. the sense of humility. Why? Because pride kills relationships, hmm. pride kills businesses. And, 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 if we, if we don't have this sense of modesty and, and, and humility, what we'll find is that uh, 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 an entrepreneur might be able to manage a business growing to about 10 people or, or 50 people, but when it gets to 100 employees, 200, or in our case, 10,000 employees, they need to be humble enough to, em to employ people who are smarter than themselves. Hmm. And if there's no sense of humility, they will never employ people smarter than themselves because they'll feel too threatened. You know, and, and we see this all the time with, with sort of the, the biotech and tech space. You know, the, the scientists invent something, it's the best thing since sliced bread, but doesn't know how to step aside to let somebody else come in as a CEO to build a business and grow the business. And if the scientist wants to carry on being the, the, uh, the, the CEO, often these businesses just blow up. Hmm. Um, so, so the humility piece and, and you know, Greg, our, our investments are, you know, with, with these businesses are over 10, 12 years. So it's a long, long relationship. And you want to be able to enjoy that, you know, that relationship, that friendship and, and, you know, you want people who are going to be teachable, who are going to be open to, to uh, new ideas and certainly open to new people coming into to the business to help them grow. Hmm. Uh, and that's why I think this, this humility piece is just so important. Hmm. There's so much of what you're saying there, um, the mending the relationships, mending relationships. And there's also the sense of, humanity in the workplace, because so often, like right now, we're discovering that teams, not individuals, are now the new atomic unit of mm. organization. Communities, not individuals, are the atomic unit of society. And when we think about teams, we often just think about the functional um, uh, inter, you know, interdependencies, but we don't also think about the emotional interdependencies, which is what relationships is all about. Um, Everything that you said reminds me of this uh, Walt Whitman quote, be curious, not judgmental. <laughs> be curious, not judgmental. And so thank you. Thank you for that. So let's bring it down to our listeners. Um, they may not, every single person is different. Everybody wants to make a difference. Uh, they may not have the background to 
create the mega partnerships to solve the problems um, in the way that you have solved them. But what can, the, what can we all do today to be significant? You know, I think, uh, I think be the change that you want to be. Um, you know, it has to start with us, really. And, you know, my, my encouragement to, to, to my students when I, when I speak to them is, you know, doing something small is better than undoing nothing. Uh, so whatever that is, you know, just go do it. I was, you know, for many, many years, I was just involved with just running biotech companies and, and, and doing all that nice stuff. Um, and, and, and then got to a point where I had to make a decision to, to sort of transition out of, uh, out of that. Um, and was fortunate enough to have the financial independence to be able to go go do it because it was just too wild and wacky to find other investors come alongside us. Um, but if you're not in that, you know, and, and, and that's a season, there's a season. I couldn't have done it earlier. Uh, so, so we just need to, to, to understand what season in our lives, you know, we're in. And, and in that season of our lives, just do, you know, the little, uh, uh, that, 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 we, that we can. So for students, um, you know, we, we would just encourage them to do whatever little they can uh, that can start to prepare them, um, for, you know, for, for a future life of, of more significance. Um, you know, it's, it's, and, and it's, it's, it, it's you, you, you need to prepare. And, and you know, often people, you know, MBA kids or, or graduates come to us and say, you know, we want to join in and we're going to come and work for you. And so we just said, no, no, don't come and don't, don't come and do this now. Go and work somewhere else. Go and, go and get some real experience, you know, and then come because then you'll be a lot more useful uh, to us uh, and, and to the people you want to serve. So, so, you know, I, I, I think for, especially for uh, young, young people, there are so many P, uh, opportunities now in the social enterprise space, right? In the philanthropy space, um, just, just go do, just go do. I, I, I love that you, you're highlighting the small moments as well, right? The small acts, the small moments, because when I look back at your story that you shared about the people, you, you are here, here because of your history teacher, your science teacher, all those people who in small moments have also invested in you. And so mm -hmm. we can also, we're part of a continuum. So we can't also discount. And, uh, I know so often today we think about scale, 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 but we forget about also the importance. And it's all about what I'm hearing from you is it's really all about thinking about the other person rather than here. Thinking about the other person, isn't it? Yeah, and, and, and you know, look, we all still need to do all the small things, you know? <laughs> Going out, um, providing food in the food banks, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, let's keep on doing that. Going out and, and, and you know, doing shopping for our neighbors. Um, these are important acts and they will prepare you to do bigger things, you know, be responsible for the little that you have uh, been charged with, uh, and, and then you will be given more. Hmm. Kim, I want to pick up on one other theme that, uh, that I so admire about uh, you, and that's the cultivation of networks, uh, mm -hmm. of relationships, because it creates multiplier effects. And it's not just that you're doing these projects and you have all this uh, oversight, but you've also developed the transformational business network that hosts conferences in Asia and in the U.S. and around Africa, around the world, um, because it seems that part of your way of thinking about a life of significance is to create a multiplier effect where there's lots of lives uh, working on this collaboratively and the significance of, of friendships uh, in that sort of uh, network. Could you talk a little bit about how you think about all of that? Yeah, it, it, very, very simply, Greg, it's because, you know, you're one individual. What can you really do? Mm -hmm. You're one drop in the ocean. You can't do it. And so very early on, when I started on this journey, I realized we need a network. We need a movement. And that's why 17 years ago, we started this 
network called the Transformational Business Network. It's a network of about three, 4,000 disillusioned philanthropists and repentant bankers. That's how we <laughs> describe ourselves, right? And we just get on planes, go to uh, have a holiday in the slums, find you know a few of a few potential businesses, put a more robust business plan around them, put mentoring in and put patient capital and help them to grow and scale their businesses. So it's, it's, it's a network and, and, and we're trying to infect people and inspire people and facilitate ways for um, people who are time poor and cash rich, but have lots of talents and ability uh, to, to help them uh, live a life that's of more significance than just, you know, of success. Uh, and, and so that's, that's, that's all about networks. And, um, you know, this is why we use conferences to gather more and more business people to inspire, facilitate and lead them out uh, to, to do more. Um, and, and the network now, you know, is also now in, involved in screening uh, businesses, small businesses, and then putting in a, a six month mentoring program to help them get their legals in place, their, their uh, accounts in place, their strategy in place before they can become investable. A lot of them just don't have all that, all those pieces and they need, they need the kind of help. So that's what the network's doing. But one of the key pieces that we build in at the very beginning is a module on character formation. Hmm. Because without that piece being right, nothing else works. Hmm. You know, and, and, and so right at the beginning, the first module of that six month program uh, is character formation. It's so important, back to humility, back to integrity. Um, so yeah, the network is, is, is really important and, and the network has helped to, to, to start to fill out this ecosystem. So when we started, it was just very private individuals like me doing it. Uh, but now with the network, we have, we have people who can come in and do seed rounds at $10,000, $20,000. We can do club deals at a quarter of a million dollars. And that is inspired and challenged some of us to leave our day job running biotech funds, uh, tech funds, now running social impact funds, living in Africa and living in Asia. And now within the ecosystem, we can do deals at a million dollars uh, uh, per, per deal up to $10 million per deal because we're running bigger and bigger funds. So, so the networks absolutely help to catalyze the ecosystem because the, the, the thing that we found, you know, with, within the, the sort of tech space and a biotech space is often it's not be, uh, companies die, not because their ideas aren't good, but they run out of cash, you know, because they had no follow on uh, funding. And so we, we take a more disciplined approach uh, and, and, and try and fill out this ecosystem so that, you know, at, at every stage now, these businesses that we are nurturing have an opportunity to raise bigger and bigger sums of money to help them to grow and scale. Uh, so, so networks are, you know, it, it networks everything. Great, it's, it's everything and, and, and building these networks and friendships and, and, and so on and, and drawing, drawing government agencies in and, and, then in, and, and then challenging governments now to allocate part of their aid money into this kind of social investing. Well, that's, that's because of the power of the network. They've seen, oh, these old, these crazy business guys are running around the world, you know, making these investments and oh, they, they can really build scalable businesses this way, right? And, and, and so our pitch to the governments and to the, 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 the sovereign wealth funds is, you know, we're not asking you to allocate all your capital, uh, you know, into this kind of, of crazy investing, you know, allocate 5%, 0.5%, which is huge, right? Uh, into this kind of investment. And, you know, it, w when you do aid and, and do charity, your return is negative. You, you do this kind of investing, it could be more, certainly more sustainable. If we do it well, and we manage it well for you, we'll give you a capital back. If we do it really well, we'll give you a capital and a return, and then you can recycle it. You know, what's, what's not to like about that? So the network and, and it, it just so, so important. So we're, 
We want to bring in more high net worth individuals, family offices, foundations, um, institutions, and, and our investors, you know, include now uh, JP Morgan Social Finance, uh, Exo Insurance, big uh, French insurance group who are really, you know, who've put several funds together. European Investment Bank have a, a social impact fund now. Um, so, so, you know, it's, 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 it's using the network to sort of um, inspire and challenge and educate, um, you know, so that we can bring more, more of this kind of capital, this kind of patient capital into, into, the, into the sector. That's so inspiring and at such a big scale and uh, impressive to, to think at, at that level and the relationships and networks that you have, have cultivated. And yet, you know, one of the things that I so admire about you is your own humility and your own relational skills on an individual level. I wonder if there, you, you've told me some stories sometime when we're talking about particular individuals who've captured your heart uh, in, in your relationships, you know, in the call center or uh, in, in specific projects. Is there, a, is there a specific story of somebody who you just kind of carry around in your heart as an inspiration from day to day? that keeps you focused on the big picture as well. Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, some of the, 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 the people, the guys from the call center, I think always of this, of the CEO himself, who've been in jail three times, you know, eight years, right? Um, nobody would fund him, nobody would believe in him. Um, and, um, but we did. Um, and and mentored him, and he was uh, able to 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 be taught, um, and has grown this business from nothing, you know, to today employing over two hundred people, sustainable, profitable business, um, and just been awarded a, 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 a contract by the government now to to have a certified training and job placement program for prisoners on parole and who've been released. I mean, this is, you know. Wow. You know, that is, that, that's just great. I, I think of another woman. Uh, we have a, 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 a chain of um, computer training centers in the slums in South Africa. My wife and I, uh, on one visit, wanted to go and see one of the new outlets that they opened up and we went with the, the founder and uh, when we got there, you know, Lavuya was the founder, called the, the lady who was doing the training out from the classroom to come and, and, and meet us. Um, and, you know, she used to be a maid and she used to have to travel by taxi from Kailicha, the township into, into, into Cape Town. And she was doing a job as a maid. Mm. And then she saw this advert for a six month paid training to have Microsoft certificate, you know? And she decided that she was gonna register and pay to, 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 do, to do this training. Finishes that training and not being satisfied, she then registers for the C++ coding program. And she graduates from that and she's just now the trainer. You know, what's that about? That's about creating an environment where there are opportunities for human flourishing to take place. Mm. You know, she doesn't need to travel in and be a maid in, in, in Cape Town anymore. She's now a trainer of others. And, and she, she was probably early 50s, mm. would have been written off. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's those kinds of individual stories um, and you, you see the the lives that are transformed and change um, yeah they, they they keep on inspiring me to keep keep on doing things hmm. thanks oh Kim if I were going to sum up uh, a main theme of this entire conversation it is about a life of significance is about seeing possibilities seeing possibilities in people, seeing possibilities in networks, and seeing possibilities in our ability to be able to affect change. And all of that is, um, we are, every one of us is part of the environment. And so being able to affect the environment and create the architecture 
her to help others. I would, Zinya, I would probably go one step further. It is seeing possibility, but it's also then serving mm. others. Yes. Because, you know, I, I think everyone would say, yeah, we see possibility and in, in, in talent in everybody. But how many of us are willing sacrificially to go and serve, mm. create the environment, mm. you know, for human flourishing? So it's seeing and acting. And of, acting. Acting. Yeah. It has to be. That's wonderful. So the genera it goes back to the very beginning, the generosity and the justice piece. The justice yep. is about acting. And yep. it's all undergirded also on this, uh, this foundation of character. Character traits such as competency and character traits such as humility. Now, something we do with all these interviews is we do a lightning round. Um, we didn't warn you this, uh, warn you about this. So that's what um, I noticed in the back. I, we know you played badminton. You're a badminton champion. In the back, there is a Retired. Sports team jersey. Um, what is uh, in the in your room? In uh, there's a framed jersey. Is that badminton jersey or? Um... That's that is Pele's jersey. <laughs> wow. The greatest footballer in the world, and behind me is Muhammad Ali. Wow! On the canvas are the Beatles. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> and, and I have another jersey, which is the England rugby team's uh, jersey. I see. So I was going to say, uh, favorite sports team? Liverpool. <laughs> last uh, and last Saracens. <laughs> Uh, last great book that you've read? Last great book that I've read? Uh, probably, I would say, The World According to Physics by uh, Professor Jim al -Khalili. Okay, you got to uh, tell us a little bit what that's about. That sounds fascinating. Uh, it, it is, it is uh, an idiot's guide to uh, quantum physics. I'm just fascinated because I, you know, I hated physics when, <laughs> when I was at school. But I mean, the, the whole world of quantum physics is just amazing. And now they just discovered another entire quantum. Oh. Now that drives <laughs> ground changing. Um, uh, favorite TV show? Oh, uh, I would say TV show. Probably one of the, the documentaries by um, uh, David Attenborough. I mean, you know, the planet series. I mean, gotta be that. All right. Vanilla or chocolate ice cream? Vanilla. <laughs> That's it. That's it for our lightning round. And you're very deliberate in all your <laughs> very thoughtful, even in lightning rounds. <laughs> <laughs> because I can't think fast enough. That's why. <laughs> you're very intentional and thoughtful about every answer. And uh, it just reveals so much into uh, the person that you are and why you're able to affect so much change in the world. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's through friendship, friendship with people like Greg uh, at, at the Templeton. And, and you know, it, we, we, we cannot do it on our own. We have to do it along with a whole lot of people. And, and you know, so people like Greg, it's so important to, to help us uh, along this journey. Well, thank Thanks so you. much for your time, Kim. It's just been wonderful and stimulating as always to hear your stories. It's always a pleasure. And Greg, thank you for being a fabulous co-host. And you are one of the people um, who have made a significant impact on so many people's lives, including my own. <laughs>